Well, good morning. We're in Joshua chapter 6 and chapter 7 this morning, and I hope that you've had a read through it. And as you've read through that, you're thinking, right, I know this story, um, the amazing events of how God brings deliverance for God's people, uh, allowing them to have victory over the city of Jericho, and then the story of Achan, which is really a story about the seriousness of sin, uh, right on the back of this incredible victory and this demonstration about the power and the wonder of God. Um, It reminds you of so much of Israel's history already. Uh, You think of uh, them at the Mount Sinai receiving the law from God, the deliverance out of Egypt, and then immediately they cast this golden calf and worship. And and here again, we see people who fragrantly ignore God's uh, purposes, his good designs and his commands, and the seriousness and the consequence of sin. But we'll come to that in a moment, uh, because as you read through these chapters, I think there's a lot that we understand and that we've known for a long time, perhaps, about this story and um, the, the, the power of God um, and the uh, great uh, military first campaign. And what do they do? They go out, march, and then shout. And all the time, it's not their victory that's on show here. It's uh, the centrality of the ark and the presence of God and that he is the one who's going to win this victory and bring about the salvation. And um, that's indeed what we see. But did you notice all the way through as you were reading, there was this reference to the the devoted things, the things that were given over to God. And in fact, that's a really important concept for us to understand what's happening in this chapter. Because surely something should concern us. And, And that is, these people are getting wiped out, an entire town destroyed. And God is doing this. And they seem to be sitting there. And, and what have they done to deserve this? But what's actually very clear in the setup to all of this is actually understanding those things that are devoted to God, belonging to him, and the way in which people have ignored God and rejected him. And in fact, all the time, um, the, the setup for why Jericho will fall, and in fact, why God's people can come into the promised land, is because the sin of the people in the promised land has reached its full measure. In fact, right back in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 16, Abraham is told that um, there will come a day when they will, his people will inherit uh, the land of Canaan, but it will not be until the iniquity of the Amorites has been completed. So there's been this long delay. Centuries have unfolded, but now the time has come where the sin of the people has reached full measure. And here comes God's judgment against sin. And it's worked out by, well, not righteous people at all, but the holiness of God. So it's just like you read in a place like Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 and 5, where it says, It is because of the wickedness of these nations that Yahweh is driving them out before you. See, this conquest is not a bunch of people marauding through the the land and just pushing out undeserving people, um, but actually this is that God is using not particularly righteous people Israel to be the instrument of his judgment on a people who had persistently revealed that they were rejecting God and continuing in their sin. And so judgment comes. And it's that picture of judgment or things that are given over to the ban, this idea that God uh, has devoted things for him and yet then they reject him, then punishment, the justice of God is meted out. And we see this as the people come into God's land. It's a picture of God's judgment falling on people and that salvation is found in him and no one else. See, actually, this doesn't depict for us a picture of the God of the old covenant, a God of wrath and anger and the God of new covenant, a God of love. But here's the God who's the same yesterday, today and forever. And he's pouring out his wrath and his justice and his love for his people by by bringing this justice to bear in such a way that he remains holy and he's calling people to account. Salvation is there and is on offer, and that's what Rahab receives. But for those who continue in their sin, they get what they want, which is the rejection of God poured out upon them. And so when you look at these chapters and the combination between the attack on Jericho and the failed attack on the city of Ai, and uh, failed because, well, there's sin in the camp, Achan has decided that he will ignore the instructions to leave everything devoted to God and to be taken into his treasury. And he takes things for himself and then hides them and lies about it. But all is seen to God. And God's wrath, as we see in chapter 7, verse 1, is at the heart of the problem. His anger is burning against Israel because he's told them 
He's shown them. He's demonstrated his capacity to provide and give them victory and salvation. And it's ignored. Achan wants to keep things for himself. And many suffer because of this. The, the failed attack on AI is a demonstration of that. But then ultimately, we see that sin must be dealt with. And the tragedy of sin. We might struggle with chapter 6 and chapter 7 in the book of Joshua and wonder about the justice and God and his mercy. But at the heart of it, it's trying to teach us something about the holiness of God and maybe the light view that we have about sin and that we think that it does not matter. But God is showing us that sin does matter. And in fact, he is the one that ultimately deals with sin. And so at the end of chapter 7, did you notice that last verse? Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since, a valley of trouble. But actually, God brings to us a salvation. That means that he turns from his fierce anger. He doesn't treat sin any differently now than he ever has. And his justice and his mercy still sit side by side. The difference is, is that he pours out his anger against sin upon himself on the cross, pouring out his wrath there in that place. And that that is the safe place where we can go and find sin dealt with. And we need that. It also tells us about the seriousness of sin and what it would look like for us to ignore it or downplay it and not see it as something that needs to be atoned for. And to realize that if we don't come to the cross and find atonement there, then we will one day stand face to face to God and bear our sin ourselves. Will you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we often think way too highly of ourselves. And here's a chapter that reminds us that where things are insurmountable and where things uh, need to be won and ultimate victories acquired, it's only you that brings about those victories. And we thank you, Lord, that just like you have shown yourself to bring your people into their promised salvation, and into that promised land, you are the one who brought us into a true and promised salvation. You are the one who defeated what we cannot defeat. The insurmountable debt that sits over us because of our sin and the consequence of death. But in your wonderful mercy and where your justice was fully dealt with, you died in our place. And you won that victory. And Heavenly Father, that points to not only your justice and your mercy, but your holiness, for you will not let sin go unpunished. And so, Lord, we pray that as we look to the story of Achan and we think about perhaps how trivial we have treated sin or how much we've tried to hide it, that we would recognise that there is a consequence for it. And would you lead us in a way of holiness that would reflect the one that we follow? So, Lord, we come with confessing lips this morning and ask that you would again take our sin and deal with it and lead us in the way that is everlasting. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.